Well, we heard the word, didn't we? Yes. Already this morning. And um, <laughs> basically, you know, a, a big portion of the message has already been preached, but, you know, I'll go ahead and preach it anyway, if you don't mind. You know, there's a little bit that, that didn't get done yet, so we'll make sure we get it all in. But God is so good to us. He is so good to us. And I am thankful to be in a place where his presence is welcome. Come on, we desire his presence in this house. There are places around the globe who really prefer him not to show up. Okay? But we welcome him here. And you know what? <laughs> he, he shows up and he is so good. He is so good. Well, how many of you are ready to get a little more food this morning? Yeah. All right, if you are ready, then I want you to repeat after me and say, I have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to me today. I have eyes to see what the Spirit of the Lord is revealing to me today. My heart is prepared to receive what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to me today. Today. I am leaving changed. You know what? If you don't really like change, I think today's change will be good. Yeah? When God changes us, when he gets involved, sometimes we don't even realize he's doing it because why he's always working. Now, I know we didn't sing that this morning, but the reality is he's always working. And there are times when we truly desire the presence of God, when we desire to worship him, when we desire to be with him and we're seeking his face and we're in his word, change is happening and it doesn't hurt because we don't realize it until all of a sudden one day we're like, whoa, I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. Or I said, this that I never used to say, or I don't do this that I did. You, you hear me? So the word today really is a painless word because God has already been working Amen. and you're just going to maybe see it a little bit more. I mean, it, it, he says the same thing a lot. It just in another way. Right. right? So you've already heard the word. He's just going to say it one more time in another way. Right. You know, there is this song that, that gets played at my other church, my place of employment, a lot. It, it, you know, the radio's on. And um, I tend to just tune it out. I, I mean, come on, how many of you just, if you, there's radio on somewhere, it's not really what you listen to, so you just tune it out, okay? And so I do, I tune it out. But there's this one song. And it's, it's one of those songs that's like you can't ignore it, even when you try right? And I, I never could understand most of the words in the song. It just, the way it's sung, I like don't even know what it's saying because it's not up very loud. So I'm not really listening hard enough to hear. I'm trying to not listen. But there's this one phrase that I can never not hear. And it's like, God brought that song to me the last couple days. And, um, We'll figure out, you know, we'll understand as we go through it. But so the phrase in the song, it says, if we could turn back time to the good old days. Now, I, I was hearing this and it's sung a certain way and it's super annoying. And um, sorry, but I'm hearing it. I'm like, really? Okay. I, you're pulling a Robert Connie on me. God said, what? You know? And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to look up the words to the song. What, what is going on with this thing? Because like I said, I don't know any of the other words of the song. That's the part I could always hear. And so I looked it up. The song is called Stressed Out. That's the name of it. Okay. And the, it, the whole thing is about wanting to go back to childhood. <laughs> It's like, you know, those days when you get taken care of, you don't have to worry about anybody else. You're not thinking about anybody else but yourself because mommy's going to take care of you. In fact, part of the song is when mommy sang me to sleep, you know, I, I was being taken care of, right? There's no real responsibilities. That's what this song is all about. I, I just want to have fun. That's what the song is about. 
So we have a culture of people who really don't want to grow up. You know, Pastor Aaron just kind of talked a little bit about the fact of not, you know, I just wasted my time at work, you know, when he was young and had an immature mindset, right? But he grew up. But we have a culture that people don't want to grow up. There's a, a spirit of childishness that's across the nation, right? How many have noticed that? Whether it's in our government, you know, trying to one up each other. have, you know, just playing their silly games with each other and the nation. Just childishness. We're not going to get into all that, but it, it's silly and immature, right? And that's for another day. I don't want to get people's blood pressure raised, right, before we get to the meat of the message. So, but, you know, or coworkers who decide they don't like you, so they get together and let's just not talk to that person. Let's not include them. Childish, right? It's just childish. Oh, people who are stressed out to the max because they have to adult. What's the word adulting? That I don't know if it's still out there big time, but it was, right? I, gotta, I have to do that adulting thing. And they're stressed out about it. Why? Because I have to care about do some other thing besides having fun. I just want to play, but I can't just play. I have to go to work. Oh, that work thing. I just wasted eight hours of my day. <laughs> I promise we did not talk to each other before this. So, <laughs> but that's the reality of where many people are living in this day. It's childish, right? Looking back at the good old days. But what happens when people do this? When, when that childish mindset sets in, the silly, immature, just, you know, I don't want to do this. I just want to play. Oh, like, what's one of the phrases? Work, I work hard, but I play hard. Because I don't really want the work. I just want the play. But I got to be able to afford the play. So I guess I better work, right? It, the whole point is, <laughs> she's going to get eggs. But the point, I'm not saying there's wrong, anything wrong with play. I'm talking about the childish mindset. What happens when you get there, you get, when you get stuck in that, is it's always focused on what? Self. So, you know, I want you to understand that this is completely different than childlike. Mm -hmm. yeah. We ought to be childlike in faith, right. Right? right? We take God at his word. Yeah. That's about a lot different than childish. Yeah. True. Okay. So I thought, I'm like, God, why are you bringing this to my attention? <laughs> what does this have to do with this message? <laughs> you know, you ever get God give you something and you're like, what does that have to do with anything else right now? I mean, I see that, yes, but why are, why are you? Well, because he wants us to understand something about the enemy. Okay. Have you ever noticed that whenever, whatever spirit is kind of um, pretty widespread, across the nation. It's the enemy's attempt to keep people from what God is doing and saying at that time, Amen. right? Okay, we can look back just a few years and what was God saying? <laughs> it's a decade of the mouth, right? And what happened during that time? Cover your mouth, yeah. right? Mask up, cover your mouth. The enemy's attempt to distract from what God was saying, what God was doing, his, his attempt to try to take people out of God's purpose. And so what is God saying now? God is saying now we have to die to self. Yeah. What is the enemy doing? I want it to be all about me, me, me. Yeah. Right? 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 Not anybody else. Right. God say, no, you, you got to die to self. We got to look upstream and see what's coming, not look back at all the yesteryear, That's right. right? So it's the enemy's attempt at taking people out of God's purpose and what he is saying, so they're distracted by the other thing. And that's exactly what's happening. And so what is God saying today in this place right now? He's saying, count up. Look forward. Look forward. So why? We're, we're, to be, we're supposed to be counting the omer. How many has been counting the omer? 
Well, all the way to Pentecost, right? Leviticus 23, 15 says, From the day after the Sabbath, that the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, you are to count off seven full weeks. You shall count off 50 days until the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. So the word that is translated as sheaf in this portion is actually the word omer. That's why we say count in the omer. Okay, for anybody who didn't know that. Um, and so it's not like we just made it up. I mean, come on. Some of you just didn't make the word up somewhere and say, let's count the omer. We don't know what it is, but we're going to, no. It comes from somewhere, right? So the uh, uh, omer is actually a measure. It's a measure of harvest. It's not just a measure of anything. It's a measure of harvest. Okay, so it's the first fruit. So God, at this, in this portion of scripture, God is commanding the children of Israel. He's like, you know what? I am taking you into a land and you are, you will reap a harvest in that land. Okay, and when you do that, I want you to take a measure. I want you to just take this portion of the barley and I want you to, the priest to bring it in and wave it before me. Okay, and so this is what he's talking about. However, he wants us to do it year after year, yeah. right? So we're, we keep the Passover and unlover bread. That's the time when this happens. And then he's like, and then I want you to start counting. Once the priest does that, the next day you start counting. And I want you to count 49 days or seven full weeks all the way to Pentecost. What, you know, 49 on the morrow was Pentecost. That's 50, right? So I want you to do that. And, you know, I, we know we do this year after year. And I'm like, God, well, uh, what do you want me to talk about about these things? Because all I heard and to begin with was, you know, counting the omer and make it count. God wants us to make this time that we're counting to count. Okay. So right now we are in the 10th day of counting the Omer, or counting up to Pentecost. And how many know that Pentecost is, as all the feasts of the Lord, a harvest feast, okay. right? Yeah. We hear it a lot around here. God is all about harvest. Right. And, you know, and we, we ought to know by now that one of the greatest harvests we could ever bring before the Lord is a soul, a person, Amen. right? Yeah. We, we may have all kinds of harvest um, that we can have in our life, but really people are the greatest one we desire to have. So, but if we're counting each day, how do we make it count? Now, I'm going to tell you, Google will tell you all kinds of things. They'll tell you all kinds of ways of how you can make each day count. You know, like um, eating right. That's a good thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good thing. Exercising. It's good even if we don't like it. Sure. Right? Um, make time for yourself. Oh, it just sounds so good. Yeah. Movies and TV, <laughs> movies and TV shows will tell you how um, how to spend less time working and more time playing or traveling. Okay, so there is a commercial out there, and you know through the commercial, I've seen it maybe a couple times. But the person who's doing the commercial is walking through like a movie set or whatever, right? And there's all different kinds of things. And he's like, you know, when you get to the end of your life, nobody is ever going to wish they had bought one more thing. They're never going to wish that they had accumulated more toys, you know, whatever. I mean, he's going through a whole list of all these things. He's like, but what you will regret is not all the places you didn't see. Right? It's a travel commercial. So, of course, they're talking about, I don't know if it's like Visa or, or whatever, but it's all about travel the world. The whole point is everything, the world's idea of making it count, you know, everyday count, is things that will make your life better. Right. Always. Bucket list, as Bishop said, absolutely. What will make your life better? How will you feel happier? Make yourself happier. Come on. You, if you're going to make it count, you've got to make yourself happier. So figure out what's really important to you. And make sure <laughs> another wake. <laughs> right? So. <laughs> but you realize that 
the, the world's view of this, it sounds so good. But it really is all about yourself, right? And so it's the opposite of what God tells us to do. Oh, and if it's the opposite of what God tells us to do, then you can be sure it's wrong. I, you know, I mean, if God didn't say it, then it's wrong. I mean, it's as simple as that. And really, it's just the enemy trying to distract from what God's saying, yeah. right? So he, the enemy, he just, he really is an enemy to your soul. He wants to keep people in the grave. He wants to keep people to, as, you know, really focused on self, as it were, like, you know, just, which is really what the grave is. It's all focused on self, right? It's just dead. And like we heard last week, but he, he really is good at selling his plans. He's, he's good at selling his plans to people. That's why so many people fall for it, including people who say they're Christians. Come on. How many of us have fallen for his, what he sold? My goodness. Yeah. If you don't raise your hand, then you're lying. I'm just saying. Somebody sold me that rake. <laughs> Somebody sold him that rake, that's right. And my husband, way too many shovels. I can't get out of that one. Just saying. <laughs> so Jesus says, in Luke in um, 9 and 23, it says, Then he said to the crowd, If any of you want to be my follower, you, you're going to have to give up your own way. Oh, man. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you're trying to hang on, if you try to hang on to your own life, you will lose it. Yeah. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Right? And what, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost and destroyed? Yeah. Come on. So, you know, when we live our, our lives for self only, we'll ultimately just cause destruction. You know, if you think about it financially, if, it's, if we're always about ourself and Self is never satisfied. It always wants more. My goodness, I can look at my wardrobe and know that for a fact. It just wants more clothes. And I disordered some, but I have to get rid of some other ones. So I'm like, okay, it was a good reason. But how many times do we're like, we don't need a thing? but I just want it, right? It doesn't matter, it's still self, you know? And so, but financially, come on, we can just accumulate. I, I work in a place where we give out loans. Oh, wow. The amount of loans that go for toys, I, I'm telling you things that it's just fun. It really has no practical use at all. It is just fun. That's it. I am not against fun, people. I'm just telling you, I like fun. But the reality is when we just are consumed with self all the time, we begin to accumulate those things that will make self feel good. Yeah. And then what? We end up in debt. All kinds of debt, right? Uh, you know, and it also can be like, oh, you know, I don't really care about anybody else. And if I do help somebody else, it's because I want to look good. I'm getting something out of it. That's what self does. Yeah. Well, there you go. Right? If self helps somebody else, it's always to get something out of it. Maybe just to build up your ego and pride, whatever it might be, but it's never about the person when self is involved. Yeah. Okay? So, you know, we could talk all day long about this stuff, but, you know, let's just move on. Because we get it that ultimately what self does is keep us from having a real relationship with God. It just keeps us from having a real relationship with God. <laughs> now, you might be thinking, okay, Elder Chrissy, we were resurrected last week. Why are we still talking about self? <laughs> we came out of the tomb, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, okay. How many had self try to rise up this last week? Oh <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Apostle Paul said that his life is Christ. And he also said, I die to self daily. There's no contradiction here. You can have been resurrected to newness of life and still need to make sure you're dying to self. Because self will try to rise up and kill that newness of life and it's gone, right? Take you back to the grave. So there's no contradiction here. It is simply, you know, God is like reminding us, you thought you weren't gonna have to deal with that anymore. Surprise! Yes, you do. So that you still gotta die daily, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, we could get into condemnation when we face battles after, you know, God did something in our life because we think we shouldn't have to deal with that anymore. Right. Wrong. Okay. So, you know, we know the enemy. He always comes immediately to steal. We know that in our head. And yet when we face something, sometimes we tend to forget it. So God's like, yeah, let me remind you. There is a real enemy. Now, you know, so how does this correlate with make it count, right? This, that's what this message is today, is it's make it count, this counting up to Pentecost. So God told us, he, I already told you, we, we have it so good here. God is so, he is so good to us. If you even consider for a moment the richness of the word we get, how much we get, it, it, I, I'm sometimes I'm just like overwhelmed. Because so many places don't have that. And they have no idea all that God has. So, he, you know, he's told us so many things. And, and how many know that in, at Trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets, God gives us stuff for an entire year, right? But how many times do we forget it after that? Because it's like it doesn't happen all then. It's really for the whole year. And he's like, I need to remind you of what I'm still doing. I haven't stopped doing it. Now, this particular word didn't, it wasn't given at Trumpets. It was given in the beginning of this Gregorian calendar, okay? However, the reality is it was still part of what God's doing unfolding for the year. And so, how many remember the message that the prophet in the house, Reverend Connie, brought about the 23s? You know, the groupings, the eight groupings of three um, words that start with P, right? How many remember? Yes. Okay. And so... One of these particular groupings, I, you know, it was really two, but we have time for one. So we're doing just one, just saying. So one of these particular groupings, it's really stood out to me more than anything else. And I really thought it was just for my life. So it's been a, a few weeks now. I've been just kind of thinking about it and like, okay, God, what are you doing here? And, um, but then he brought it back to me again this week. And it was like, this is for this message. This is what I want you, you're going to do to make it count for these next 40 days. Okay, this is what God is doing. And so, um, and how many remember the three Ps, plague, purge, and pierce the darkness? Okay. Now, when, when the word first came to us, almost, there was only one person that I rec recall on the chat, the, um, the blog that said that that stood out to him. Reverend Ryan, you know, because <laughs> nobody else. It didn't stand out to anybody else. However, God is saying everybody needs to hear it now. Okay? Because okay? this is what he's doing. So Psalms 89 and 23 is the verse that Reverend Connie gave with this. And it says, I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. Now, God is talking about David here, right? He, it, it's like he's saying, I'm not going to let David's enemies get the best of him. I will actually get involved and plague them. In other words, if somebody messes with one of God's people, he takes it personally. That's right. Okay? God takes it very personally. And um, it doesn't go so well for that enemy. That's 
That's what he's saying. He's like, I will get involved and it's not gonna be so good for them. But one of the things that the prophets, that God said through the prophet is, if God could do it for David, he can do it for you too. He could do it for us in this house. And God is saying right now, I'm doing it for you. Okay? So this reminded me, it, when, as I began to look at this, it reminded me of one of the blessings of the Passover offering. And I know pretty much everybody in this place gave a Passover offering. You know, what is one of those blessings? That God will be an enemy to your enemy. An adversary to your adversary. So we don't have to shrink back from obeying God because he fights for us. Now, he is not telling us to go out and stir up trouble. That's not what he's saying. He's saying when you obey me, I will have your back. Okay, so it's about what God's doing, not about what we want to do. Okay, because sometimes our flesh gets involved. And sometimes that flesh needs to be destroyed. He's not gonna, you know, we have to make sure it's God, right? So, but there was another aspect of this that I see as I'm looking at this. Um, it, it wasn't something that the prophet brought out, but it's something I saw as I'm looking through this. So um, what is something that David was known for other than being king? He knew how to rock and roll. <laughs> he was known for praise and worship, right? So, yeah, <laughs> Bishop's got another thing going over there. But we're talking about how we make it count, right? So, <laughs> we're going to make it count. <laughs> so, David even sings in Psalms 107, 8. He says, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. How do we make it count? Up this, you know, the, as we count the next 40 days up to Pentecost, we praise and worship God. All right. Today, what we, it was all about coming to his altar. Yeah. Come on, find a place. How do you do that? You worship him. We are not going to find a place at his altar if we come with an attitude, as Pastor Aaron was talking about. If we come with something else, we come with worship. We enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, and then we worship Right? So that's what God is saying. We, th this is one way we're going to make it count. And do you understand that when we praise, praise stills the enemy? Yes. Right? So do you think for a moment that the enemy is going to lay down in defeat because you're dying to self daily? Well, Absolutely not. He will amp up his game and come at you in a way that he just, maybe you didn't see coming if you weren't looking. So what do we, what do, we do when we hear that little whisper? Or maybe it's loud coming out of somebody. Praise God, yeah. right? We praise. So, and you know, what do we do when we don't necessarily hear the enemy? <laughs> we praise God, right? <laughs> we worship our king. Yeah. You know, not only um, will this still the enemy, but as we praise God, as we worship him, we will come closer to him. That was an instruction he gave, do you remember? You know, when we got, during Unlover Bread, get the leaven out because I want you to get to know me better, get in an intimate relationship. He's not done with that. Come on, he's not done with that. Get closer to him. He wants a real relationship with us. Why? When we are praising him, when we are worshiping him, we are putting our focus on him and not the problems of our life. Yeah. Right? And then guess what? He gets involved and deals with the enemy. So those enemy, those things that the enemy tries to bring to get you down, to get you back in the grave, as it were, God will turn it around. As you praise him, as you worship him, as you're focused on him, as you're seeking his face, he will get involved and deal with that enemy. Yeah, right. Just as he did with David. Come on, David was a worshiper. God said he was a man after his own heart because he was quick to repent. He understood how to stay in right relationship with God, even when he messed up. And the thing is that God always got involved and said, I'm going to deal with that thing. 
I'm going to deal with that enemy because you understand how to get to my heart. Come on, that's what God is looking for. We can make it count in these next 40 days by worshiping him and keeping that relationship with him. So, the next P. Purge. The prophet said that purging is constant. Come on, I looked back at my notes. I'm like, what is she doing? I re-listened to some of the message. <laughs> we need to purge some things regularly. So it kind of sounds like dying to self daily, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. And so we make it count when we recognize the things in our life that are not godly. Come on, those things that are in opposition to what God is doing, that take us away from him instead of bringing us closer to him. Yeah. We have to purge it. Yeah. 2 Timothy in uh, chapter 2 and verse 20, it says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared of ever, unto every good work. Now, what it's really talking about is purging yourself of all those things that, that are not of God. You know, that there was a lot of talking in ways that were not godly ways, okay? And so what's your conversation? Purge it. You know, as I was looking through some different things about counting the Omer, I saw a couple of things. And one of the things that it, it would, is with some of the Jewish teaching talks about this time as the time where, you know, deliverance took place for the children of Israel out of Egypt in order to, to take them to um, the Pentecost, right, to that time for the revelation of the Torah. So, the tradition is, and for many of them, is that of sanctifying oneself during this time, the seven-week period, right? By engaging in repentance for the purpose of receiving a personal revelation of the Torah. Okay, personal. So it's powerful. I, I want you to understand. Let's, let's just say it in our, our language here, right? We can word, read the word of God. Come on. You can read this word. Day after day, day after day, day after day. But if it never gets from our head to our heart, we're not changed. Yeah. If it never goes from knowledge to becoming life in our life, we're not changed. Amen. So the journey allows us to position ourselves from going from knowledge to life in our life allowing the revelation that opens everything up. Come on, that light bulb moment where you're like, ah, I get it now. Now, one definition of purge is cleansing. So this is what we just talked about here. You know, they, they, in the Jewish teaching, they talk about it being a time of repentance. So... And we know that cleansing can take place when we repent, right? So we're in spring. <laughs> Let us make it count as we count up to Pentecost with some spring cleaning, as it were, of uh, any residue of self hanging around. Okay. Any residue of those things that are not for God, but against God. Right. Any residue of anything that would take you back to the grave. So repentance is going to be the key. We have to turn from those things and turn back to God. You know, if there are, I had this thought of, you know, if there's things in our life that eat up our time and we know that they are really a time waster, it's not anything that's really productive for our life in any way. They're just a time waster, but we do them we have them in our life, it's time to purge it, right? If there are relationships that God has been dealing with you about that he's like, <laughs> it is stealing from you. Purge it. Walk away. 
If there are food in your cupboard that you know you shouldn't eat, purge it. Okay, come on, I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know? We all have, there's something, okay, something that needs to be purged during this time. So, we don't, we're purging all these things, you know, it's a daily thing of dying to self, and we look at the things that need to be cleaned out, we clean them out, because if we don't, they just take up space where God should be. You know, remember that we don't add God to our life. He is our life. So we, we shouldn't think that we can have all these other things taking up room and we'll fit him in where we can. That's not how it works, church. It doesn't work that way. God's like, I don't want to just hang out with you for date night. I really want us to be one. One. When there's oneness, there's no separation, right? He, you know, <laughs> we, I know we learned the God kind of life is the real life. That could, that's what God wants us to have, the real life that is him. Because everything else is just existence full of appetites and desires that ultimately lead to destruction, so how do we make it count? We purge some things during this time. Okay? But why is that so important for this message and for what God is saying right now as we're making it count? Because if we don't do that, we can't have the next one. Right. And the next P is where all of us want to get to. But we have to have that relationship with God first. We have to die to self first because that next P is pierce the darkness. Come on, how many desire? You look around and you see darkness everywhere. And you so want to help the people get out of it. But you felt helpless because self had been in the way. Come on, we have to get to that place. So Proverbs 4 and 8, 19 says, the way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Wow. They have no idea. Yeah. In Matthew 6, 22, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep is that darkness? Jesus said this. Come on, people don't know that they're stumbling around because they can't see but think they can. And in order for them to truly see, somebody has got to pierce the darkness. Yes. Hebrews 4 and 12 through 13, it says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. So how do we, we pierce the darkness in people's eyes? The word of God. The word of God. This word of God? How about no? If we just pick a scripture out of here, we've heard this a hundred times, church. Let's hear it again today. Let's hear it. If we just pick anything out and say something to somebody, is it going to pierce their darkness? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. In fact, they're just going to think you're speaking mumbo jumbo. What are you saying? What are you talking about? Okay. However, uh, we just heard that nothing is hidden from God. 
He, uh, he, everything is naked and exposed from his, for his eyes. He knows exactly what the problem is. So he knows exactly how to pierce that darkness. So we have to have a word from his throne on th for that person. It needs to be the voice of God. What did we hear last week? When they hear the voice, yeah. come on. They rise from the dead, right? And or it's the same, God is saying literally the same thing this week. It's just pierce the darkness. But it's the same word. When they hear the voice of God, then that pierces the darkness. Okay? Or as Reverend Ryan said last week, rolls the stone away. Okay? It's the same, it's the same thing. So how do we make it count? We praise and worship God, getting closer to him, purging anything left of self so that we can hear what he is saying for someone else's life, that word that will pierce their darkness in that moment. We got to get right to the root. I, I, I want you to understand that that word, because in here, the word that is sharper than two-edged sword, right? It cuts between some things. So the word of God, he will be able to cut right to the very root of things. It will separate some things. So you can see what's really going on, right? It may even expose some things that keep people in darkness. And even allow us to see what we didn't know was there. But God knew. Right. Come on. The desire to bring people out of darkness is, whew, that is where we're at. That, that is, and that's where God's at. <laughs> oh, and you know what? We can rejoice when it happens. We can absolutely rejoice when God gives a word and we declare what he is saying and his voice is heard and that per person comes out of that darkness. We can rejoice. But I want to, I want to tell you today that there are going to be times when you will declare what God has said and they will not come out of darkness. God may, gave me an opportunity to see this. I'm not going to give a bunch of details. I'm not going to go into all of that. But what I want you to understand is that there are times this may happen. You know, in the last few weeks, I, I've seen some things I had been, I, I, I didn't know it was going to turn out the way it did. You ever have a, a vision in your head of what you think God is doing? And if we really listened, he would say, that's not what I'm doing, <laughs> right? But we, we don't always, we think we know. But we didn't really hear what he said about that. We just kind of hoped and thought. So the thing is, is that he knew this person's heart. He already knew what was going on inside of them, but I thought I saw some signs of them opening up because they were listening. They were listening. When I would talk about the Lord and share some things with them and, and acted like they were interested, like they wanted to learn, that they, that's what they acted like. And, and so, and this person began to, it was started sharing about dealing with some physical things and, and my heart just broke and I'm like, oh God, you know, give me an answer. I, I want an answer for this person. I want an answer for this person because the doctors don't know. They can't give this person an answer. I want an answer, you know, not asking him, do you want to give an answer? I didn't ask him, not once. Do you, what do you want to do here, God? I just kept knocking and knocking until he gave it. And he did. Yeah. And he gave me the answer. But see, he already knew what the person would do with that answer. That's right. I didn't. Until the darkness was pierced by giving that word that was from the Lord. The answer. And that person said, no. Agreed that it was probably right but said no to God. I mean, just in a moment, the line was made. Up to that point, the person didn't say it. They were listening. I didn't know that there was other things going on because I didn't ask God what's really going on here. I thought I knew, so I didn't ask. When we think we know something, we don't ask. And because we don't ask, 
we miss what is really happening. But my eyes were open when the darkness was pierced. The evidence was so real because that person wanted the darkness more than the answer. I, I don't want God. I don't care if what he says and if I turn to him that he could literally take this heat and heal my body. I, I don't want him. I say no. I would rather live with this than be with God. That, that's what this person did. I have to be okay with that. You have to be okay with that. So when... The reality is when God gives a word, there are times that he gives you that knowing it'll pierce that darkness to reveal to the person what they really want. They may not know that they really don't want him. That's right. That's right. Okay. And then there's other times they'll come out. So when we get the no, we cannot be discouraged and not go about seeking for somebody else. Okay, God, what are you doing? And, and, you know, we have to get to that place. What are you doing? Not what I want you to do, not the person I see. And I'm like, oh God, if you would just move in their life, if you would just do this, because how many times do we do that? We see somebody and our heart breaks and we, and all the stuff that we do. And, and we're like, oh God, just do something, just do something, just do something. And he's like, did you even ask me Come on. what I want? Excellent. We have to get to that place to make it count this month. In order to know what and hear him and what he's really doing, we have got to get closer to him. That means we have got to praise him. We have got to worship him. We have got to purge some things out because if we want to get to the place of purging, piercing that darkness, we, we, we have to know what he's saying. And we have to be willing to put our own mind, our own thoughts, our own desires for a person away. Yes. And say, what do you say, God? That's it. Amen. Because that is when it will really make a difference. Yes. It'll give people truly to the place of yes or no. As long as we allow people to stay in a place of maybe... Nothing ever changes in their life. I'm going to tell you when this person said no, she didn't say no with her words. She said no in her heart and I felt it. God knew it. It was like the way she said her response was a no. And I, heard, I mean, in that moment, I heard it for what it was. I should have heard it before, but I heard it for what it was in that time. And from that moment, God immediately, I mean, it was like immediate the enemy started coming in and doing in her what she really wanted. And I'm telling you, it unfolded over the last couple weeks. And the Judas showed up. I'm just saying. It happens. But God needs people to get to a place of seeing where they're really at. And you need to see it. That's right. Whether they're for him or against him. We will rejoice and bring in the harvest before him of those who want to come out of darkness. Come on, if they don't want to come out, let's not bring them in the doors. There is no point of it. Let's stop dragging people to this place because we want them here and find out, God, what do you say? Do they even want you? Because if they don't want you, they're going to bring their darkness in here and try to spread it around. There's no point in doing that. No point at all. We might as well make sure we hear from God and find out what he's doing so when the darkness is pierced and somebody comes out, we can bring them rejoicing because we know that they're going to be one who was willing to be discipled. They're going to be one who is willing to, to seek God for themselves and they're going to be willing to purge some things and they're going to be willing to go out and listen to God so they, that too, can pierce darkness. Come on. Come on. We have to be willing to lay it aside. Church, let's make it count. These next 40 days, the rest of these 40 days that we're counting up. Every day, I want to come before God at Pentecost with a real harvest. I want to say, here, God, you have a harvest of a changed person, and here's somebody else who you changed in the process. How many want to see this city saved? God said he is, <laughs> what is he doing? Visiting, right? The city. Yeah. 
Well, how many know that he is visiting the city to divide their separation taking place? Because there's those who really want to come out and those who really like darkness. So he is visiting the city. We want to immediately think, oh God, you're going to save the whole city. You're visiting the city. Yeah, no. Mm -mm. He has to separate some things. It's a good hour, church. And if we will truly do this, what God is saying to do and obey him and make it count, we will be able to see that separation in our own harvest fields. And don't get disappointed if you don't have a whole bucket load of people coming with you because it may be, God said it was going to be small to begin with and that it would increase throughout the year, right? The harvest. Well, it may be because the separation has to take place and there's not a whole lot at first. Just go get the one. We have to hear what he's saying. We have to hear what he's saying. See what he's doing. Thank you, Elder it's a good day, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. It is a good day. I don't think I need to go through the whole thing again, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna give you one more verse, and I'm really declaring this verse over you. First Peter two and nine and ten. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, which in the time past you were not a people, but now you are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. God has call, already called you out of darkness and made you his. Now he's asking us to go do the same for others. That somebody else who's willing to come out can be made his. Yeah, willing. They have to be willing. And when they're willing to come out, he will make them his. Come on. He already knows he's willing. Amen. Thank you, Father. God, you are so good. Yeah. You are so good. <laughs> you have to tell us the same thing a lot of times. And, you know, because you know that we don't always hear the first, second, tenth time. How many times? But God, thank you for not, not giving up because this truly is a year that you are completing tabernacles. You are finishing what you've started. And God, I thank you that each one of these people, as we count up, as we make it count for these next 40 days that we're counting, that we begin to see and, and hear your voice in ways that we never have because we've chosen. You've already called us out, God. We chose to make you first and foremost in our life. You are our life. So we worship you. We cleanse out anything in the way so that we're in position for you to speak in somebody else's life. God, we're so grateful that you chose this people for that purpose. So right now we say, here we are, God. Here we are. We will obey you. We will obey you. We will follow your instruction. God, I thank you for it. I thank you for every person in this house, every person online who chooses today and says, yes, God, you brought me out of darkness. I will for these next 40 days. I will make it count, like you've said. And I know that at the end, I will have a harvest to bring to you that is pure. It is not tainted. Thank you for it, Father. Thank you for it. We give you praise. Amen. Come on, I... What I really want us to do right now, Melissa said it earlier, seek a place at the altar. You need to seek a place in his presence and worship. You have to start there because if we don't start there, we'll never do the rest. Come on, we're gonna, every day, 
but let us do that today. I want you to seek a place at the altar. This isn't about a place at the altar so Elder Chrissy can lay hands on you. This is about a place at the altar in his presence because you know that he is the one who gives everything. He's the one who will do this through you. He's the one who you have to hear. It's him that you want. Come on, if you really want him, let, us, let him know it right now. That's what it's about. Seek a place at the altar in his presence. I want you to do this today because you'll know how to do it tomorrow and you'll know how to do it the next day as you purge things out and you get yourself in position to hear what he is saying for somebody else's life. That's what's going on right now. Thank you for it, God.